interesting things about shoes is that all across the world, from ancient China to ancient Egypt, um, Native American culture, uh, Javanese culture, Zulu culture, there are stories about shoes and magic. So, I'm, you know, and in popular culture today, you know, we have uh, the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy in her ruby slippers. Uh, there's the god um, uh, Hermes, who, you know, with his winged sandals. Um, there is, in England, we have a story about um, a pair of boots where you can walk for seven miles with every step. So, you know, where you find shoes, you will often find magic. But one of the things I wanted to do with footwork is show that shoes are not magical. They are very real objects. You know, they, are, they have been made by, with uh, leather and plastic and cotton um, and, uh, and foam and more plastic and then just tightly bonded together. So instead of just looking at the fairy tales about the footwear industry, we also need to look at the reality um, of the footwear industry. And one of the people that I met who I want to quickly tell you about was a, a factory worker, a shoe factory worker, and uh, her name uh, is Sebnem. And she wakes up every morning at 6 a.m. She gets on a bus at 6.30 a.m. and her shift starts at 7 a.m. And uh, she works uh, cleaning and polishing boots and shoes. So she has to put her hand inside the shoe or the boot and then polish it. And she ends up with black polish and navy polish all over her, her arms. Um, and there are two magic tricks that the factory and her boss at the factory are uh, doing. The first trick that is performed is that when her boss like clicks his fingers, her contracts as to how long her day should be just magically disappear. So she has no idea how long she's supposed to be working. The second thing, the second magic trick that the factory does is that no matter how many hours Sebnem worked, and this was hugely frustrating for her, no matter how many hours she works, she gets paid the same amount. So no matter how much overtime she does, she is always paid 197 euros per month. And the horrible thing for her is that even uh, one of the jobs she has to do is stick these little labels onto the, onto the shoes to say how much they are. And frequently what she found is that she was sticking labels onto shoes where the shoes were more expensive than, uh, than, than what she had earned for an entire month of, of work. And um, I've been thinking about her a lot because one of the things that really upset her was the state of her dirty arms and hands. And she would bring her own soap to the factory in order to, to wash. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, and, the, and the bathroom was like quite a walk away as well. And I've been thinking a lot about her during COVID. And, and as I was saying this morning, like how do you manage to keep yourself uh, clean uh, you know, during a pandemic in that kind of, of factory? And while Sebnem is a real person, she's a real woman in, in Eastern Europe, um, she also represents a key pillar of globalization with her unpaid overtime, her minuscule wages, her really unhealthy working conditions, and the struggle that she faces every day in order to try and feed and look after her family. She represents the economic system and the people holding up the economic system that we, um, that we live in. And shoes, I just think, are fascinating because they were one of the first objects to undergo truly globalized production. And so in every shoe that I own and in every shoe that you own, we are carrying the world and we are carrying the interdependencies that shape our world and also the injustices that shape our world. And what I discovered whilst researching footwork is that the fashion industry is bad. Like we all know the fashion industry is bad. The footwear industry is about 10 years behind the rest of the fashion industry in terms of transparency, in terms of condition and health, uh, and certainly in terms of child labor. 
um, as well. So I would, I would urge all of you, if you're interested in fashion and fashion activism and changing things, like you need to you know, get involved with shoes um, as well. And in particular, one thing that I found with, uh, with uh, shoes is that it is not just about factory work. Um, it's also about homework and people working at home. And um, just give me a little wave if you have worked from home in the last six months, if you've become a, a home worker. Who's done that? I can see, yes. So most of us have done that. So if you've been working at home in the last six months, you have experienced some of the things that shoe home workers have experienced. So number one, who is paying for the uh, the room where you have your desk and your laptop and where you're working away like your boss isn't paying for it you are paying your rent and your mortgage that cost is on you similarly the uh, electricity the electricity that runs your laptop who's paying for that is your boss paying for it no you are paying for it and this is why uh, factory owners really love home workers because all the costs are transferred from the factory straight onto this home. And the other thing you've probably found, and I found it as well, is that homes are not actually very good places to work. So I've ended up, you know, my, my back hurts, my, I don't have a proper seat uh, to work in. And, you know, imagine that you're not in a, a nice house or a nice apartment in Munster, but that you're in a, a one, room, one room house in, uh, like in Lahore in the industrial districts and there's you and your husband or your wife and your three children and maybe your sister and her baby and you're all living uh, together and the uh, agent from the factory comes round and he just gives you a sack of shoe parts and he gives you uh, some bags of little beads and he gives you a glue gun and he says right I want you know these patterns like these flower patterns stuck on here and the light is not good, you know, you're trying to pay your electricity bills, but it's quite dark where you're working. Um, you're crouched over, you don't have a proper space to work. The ventilation is terrible. And now in your house, you have these like massive pots of glue, like very flammable, very dangerous glue, which is releasing all of these chemicals and these fumes. So, you know, your back is hurting, your eyes are hurting, your nose and your lungs are hurting, but you have to keep going. And, you know, God forbid, if something sets fire to that glue, like your house can, you know, can burn down. And, and this is something that, that happens. And home workers are in particular a very, a, a huge reason why shoes continue to be so cheap. Because, you know, as supply chains get longer and longer and more, and more complex, um, what we see manufacturers are doing is um, subcontracting to home workers. Uh, and so the real price of shoes is being borne by these people in their homes and by, you know, by their backs and their eyes and their lungs uh, and by the safety of their children with these enormous you know, vats of, of glue. Um, and I want to, I think maybe in the questions, we can talk about some of the positive, interesting things. But I very quickly, I think it's important to touch on the lowest rung of the ladder when it comes to shoe production. Um, and this is, you know, this is another reason why shoes are so uh, like geopolitical. Um, and for that, to get to the lowest rung of the ladder, we have to go to basement workshops in Turkey. Uh, because what's happened with the with the war on Syria, as you know, millions of people have crossed over the border uh, to, to find safety in Turkey. And Turkey has taken in millions of people. But in order to survive, many of these families have had to send their children into some of these basement workshops to become shoe workers. And so we now have children in shoe supply chains working from 7 a.m. till 10 p.m., and journalists in Turkey have found children as young as six years old and they are hired because, you know, they are they can be paid as little as 25 to 35 pounds per month. Um, and the work that they're doing is very dangerous. Again, there's the glue, like the, the shoe industry is just swamped with glue. So there's glue and there's knives, you know, and there's work and there's a fact like workshop owners who are, who can, you know, who, who can be abusive as well. Um, 
and and you know and this is something again this is another reason why shoes uh, stay so cheap is because the labor costs are are shockingly and horribly low and of course the final injustice with that situation is that these are shoes that are being made for export so at the end of the day off the shoes go they go to germany they go to france they go to italy they go to britain and the shoes can cross over that border and are welcomed into the rest of europe the children on the other hand are not welcome and this is a symbol of the the the, the, the system that we live in where globalized capital can cross over and that the children you know refugee children are not allowed in um, i mean obviously germany has been doing a much better job than my country like britain is is one of the worst and uh, shamefully bad but you know it's a it's an extremely unjust uh system and like this is why i continue to like writing about clothing and shoes because it really does illuminate the system that we live in and some of the darkest corners um of our of our world um uh, there's a lot in footwork about the environmental impact uh, of shoes and if somebody wants to ask a question about like shoe recycling I'm happy to talk about that and, and you know and the problems there and the ecological problems there um, I'm aware I don't have loads of time so I'm going to touch quickly on leather something we were talking about in the breakout room because I think that's another thing as, as fashion activists and citizens that we need to be very conscious of. Um, and I'm not sure if any of you know, but the, the number one cause of Amazon deforestation is cattle farming. And 50% of all leather products that are made are shoes. So our supply chains are directly impacting on issues as big as deforestation or, uh, of the Amazon rainforest and, uh, and climate change. Another really, really grim fact about the leather industry is that it was found that a tannery worker in Bangladesh has a 90% chance of being dead by the age of 50. And this is because of the chemicals that go into producing leather. So I don't know if any of you have, have ever uh, left uh, like a, a, if you eat meat like you've left an old piece of chicken in the bin um, or maybe you've gone on a walk and uh, you've found in the country and there's been a dead sheep or whatever uh, and the smell of the chicken in the bin or the dead sheep is terrible you know so it's rotting like rotting animal flesh and that is what would happen to cow's skin if you just left it so in order to prevent that from happening the leather industry needs to apply hugely toxic chemicals onto this skin to stop it from rotting away. So you have chemicals like chromium and chromium-6, sulfur dioxide, ammonium chloride, um, and they create a toxic soup, which is strong enough to corrode, you know, the laptop that I'm talking to you on, or, you know, all the cars that are parked outside. Like this is horrendously strong uh, chemicals. And then if you think about like these, like young, like boys and men um, and people wading through this chemical, then you start to understand why it is that, they, that their life expectancy is being cut so horribly short. And, you know, I, I visited Bangladesh and I went to see uh, the, the Buri Ganga River, which runs through the heart of Dhaka, the capital city. And this is a river that as a result of the tanneries was declared biologically dead. So when I saw it, it was black, the water was black and no fish and, or plants like were, were capable of, of, of living in it. And, um, you know, and, and, and this, is, this, is, this is the reality of the shoe industry. It's absolutely, uh, it's absolutely unforgivable. Um, and, uh, and of course, you know, this is leather for export, Brazilian leather, Bangladeshi leather is everywhere in the, sh in the, shoe, in the shoe supply chain. You know, it goes to China, China is the number one producer of, of footwear in the world. And then it's exported to us. You know, each of, each of you and me, like we'll have Brazilian leather and Bangladeshi leather that's been made in China uh, in, our, in, in, in our cupboards uh, and, and in our houses. Um, so yes, Francesca, how long, how many minutes have I got left? Oh, I can't hear you, I can't. 
um, you have left about um, yeah about uh, five to six minutes or if it's it's okay we have a space uh, of um, 60 minutes in total so um, yeah don't worry <laughs> okay um well I think so that's kind of a whistle stop tour through some of the bad like the worst bits the worst bits of labor and the worst bits of the the environmental impact I mean I think it probably is useful if I talk about uh, some of the things that, that I think could change in in the shoe industry um, and I thought I see this as like like T L and P are the three things um, and of course as I was saying in the fashion talk like COVID I think does provide us with an opportunity to really like think about these things and and think about the kind of system that we that we live in because one of the statistics that sparked footwork is this fact that as as humanity we make 66.3 million pairs of shoes every year uh, which is 24.2 billion in a year and you know this is just creating i mean the, the consequences of producing and consuming on that on that level is what i have filled an entire book with like it's very it's very very extreme and it's, it's very very dangerous and you know, we are on the brink, the brink of ecological disaster. Um, so, you know, we, so we need to be thinking about like, what, what can we do? And for me, yeah, TLP, the first one is trade unions, as I, as I said earlier, um, that everybody across the shoe supply chain and the fashion supply chain should have the right to an independent trade union where they can negotiate their wages, crucially their working hours, so that we can deal with this insane overproduction and the, the safety conditions. And of course, nobody should be fired or beaten or killed for trying just to stand up uh, for themselves. And I think that would help to start rebalance the, the industry. The second thing, so L, is legislation. And what we've seen over the last 30 years is a dramatic rise in corporate power, which hasn't been met by legislation that can um that can deal with some of the excesses of corporate power and that's why you know, i'm very interested to, to to hear more about what germany is doing in that regard you know how do we start just tempering or reducing the power of corporations when they act in 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 the global south and and the third one is for p is for pricing um and this what we need is is for brands to stop pushing and pushing factories for lower and lower prices um, because it's this insistence on rock bottom prices that sees laws being bypassed that sees dangerous factories um, and which sees this awful pollution of the environment because you know there's no time or money to invest in uh, in proper environmental safeguards and uh, then of course so you know we've got TLP because we're quite big things that we need to do and so then it's like how do we do this and again because shoes are so personal it's such a personal object that emphasis is always put on oh how do I change myself like how do I change my wardrobe but actually when you think about it in terms of like T L and P we are talking about changing the world and whilst you know you can reset your relationship with consumerism and you can repair and you can maintain what you have and you can reduce your shopping we also do need to be active you know actively changing the world as well and, and working in a space where we're prioritizing political change and like this is the really exciting bit for me this is where we come together as, as a generation you know as citizens and uh, and with our elected rep representatives and we you know and we demand change you know we say that we're not like we're not we're not putting up uh, with this anymore and there's a couple of really cool examples from the footwear industry there have been some absolutely enormous strikes there's a, a Taiwanese company called Yu Yen that operates in China and in 2014 40,000 workers at one factory walked out on strike they were very angry about they weren't being paid their employment benefits and their housing benefits as they should have been and it was a very tough it was a very difficult strike you know the chinese government was not happy with what was happening at all 
But um, eventually, the strike ended up costing Yu Yen $100 million. And so then they couldn't take it anymore. And they just said, all right, you know, we'll do, you know, we give in, we'll do, we'll do what, what you want. Um, but obviously, you don't have to be a shoe worker to create political change. And so there's another nice example from the uh, United Students Against Sweatshops who took on one of the biggest shoe companies in the world. You know, they took on Nike um, because Nike said it was no longer going to allow the Workers' Rights Consortium, the WRC, to monitor factories, which was a huge blow for transparency and supply chain uh, responsibility. And so, uh, so USAS took them on. You know, they took them on right across America. And, uh, you know, they, brought, they did speaker tours, they did pickets, they, they threatened like boycotts of Nike, um, and they really kind of kicked up a big fuss on their campuses. Uh, and it took, you know, it took two years, but eventually Nike said, okay, like they gave up as well. And they said, all right, we'll let, we'll let the WRC come back uh, like in, into the factories. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't want people to feel like it's all bad news. Like once we start acting collectively, um, you know, and, and, and working on a, on, a, on a global level, then there really are things um, that we can do and, um, and we can, you know, raise our, raise our goals as high as, as, high as, as, high as we like. Um, and I, I think it's, it's something that we must do because within, within the footwear industry, you know, you have the systemic exploitation of women, you have the systemic exploitation of the global South, you have the creation and the maintenance of racism and the exploitation of class and poverty. So eventually, I feel like it, once you start working in, in trying to change the shoe industry, then you come up against some like quite big questions about the system that we live in. But I think it's some of the smaller, the really simple questions that hold the key. So for example, is it worth destroying the rainforest in order to uh, make a new pair of trainers? And is it right that tannery workers have a life expectancy of 50? And if in your heart, I mean, I know in my heart, the answer to those questions is no. Um, but, and if you know, if you feel that too, then you know, we have to start asking ourselves, what are we doing in a system that says that the answer to those questions is yes that the rainforest is worthless, that the tannery workers' lives are worthless and should be sacrificed to corporate profit. So eventually, you know, we come up against some, some systemic problems um, which, we, which we have to act collectively to fix um, as well. Um, but yes, we've had our shoe, we've had shoes for about 40,000 years and in every pair we carry the world. And I, I just think they are as, as good an object as any to, to carry us into like a fair, a democratic and equal equal system and and society